Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give a talk today. So I'm going to be talking about data-driven materials discovery and try to show you how we might go about doing that. So uh, stating the obvious quite deliberately, data-driven materials discovery, we need data. And so let's begin by actually thinking about what type of data we might need. And I guess ideally you would want to have the entire universe of all possible chemicals that could ever exist. And for each of those chemicals have their cognate material properties. And that's because there's an inherent link between the structure and property of a material, which gives rise to patterns in data, which you can then use to mine to predict new materials for a given application. Now, we don't have the entire universe of all possible chemicals and their cognate material properties. And yet, to a first order approximation, we have a representative set of that, albeit in a highly fragmented form. And that fragmented form is the scientific literature. There'll be people in the audience today who have written a paper on one material and its cognate properties. And there'll be another person in the audience today who've written a paper about another material and its cognate properties. So the idea is to pull all of this together. And so it's with that spirit that um, we uh, have developed a tool called Chem Data Extractor. And uh, this, what this does is it extracts from the text in high throughput level, so literally thousands and thousands of documents at a time, the chemical and property of information of interest. And with that, it then collates the information and it, it puts it into a materials database for you. And then you have your way of custom making materials databases for your own materials application of interest. So let's see how that works under the hood. So this is uh, essentially the input and output of Chem Data Extractor. Uh, so input is your scientific literature. So it can literally be thousands of documents and it will find the chemical information uh, that would be say the it could be a chemical structure. It could be the formula in text and so on. And it will also find the property of which you asked of it. And uh, you have to ask you know, wh what you want. And it will then collate that chemical and property information and put it into a chemical database automatically for you. It is a tool, so it's not you know, plug and play. You do have to work with it to make it work. Uh, but nonetheless, that's essentially the pipeline. I'd like to at this point acknowledge uh, Matt Swain, who has uh, put a really big uh, uh, amount of effort into uh, uh, Chem Data Extractor uh, via version one. And let's see how Chem Data Extractor works. So essentially, uh, I will explain this by example because it's easiest. And uh, if you can imagine the, the sentence we have in the, the top here, uh, which is very common in a, in a scientific paper, right? So figure two shows the UV vis absorption spectra of 3A, bracket red, and 3B, bracket blue, in acetonitrile. So the first thing that uh, uh, happens is that uh, we call up essentially something called the natural language processing pipeline, which uh, essentially is a, is a you know, is methodology that comes from computer science. But it's, it, this is your text mining. Um, and I'll, I'll get to the point where we then deviate from a chemistry perspective. Um, but uh, let's go through the natural language processing pipeline, first of all. So we first of all uh, break that sentence down every, and this is the true of every single sentence in the paper that you're the papers that you're mining so for each sentence we break the the sentence down into its constituent parts so that's every word every number every punctuation parenthesis and so on and those constituent parts are then called tokens and then what we do is we assign a grammar to those tokens Right, so figure is a noun. So you see in the, the, the third box down, it says NN, that's a noun. Two is a cardinal digit, CD, or cardinal decimal. You have spectra, right, that's a noun, but it's, it's plural. And acetonitrile, that's an interesting one. It's deliberately in orange uh, because it's what they call a chemical mention. So that means it's it's a noun, but it's, it's, a, it's a specific chemistry uh, type word. Now the other uh, orange, uh, tokens that it's it's uh, highlighted are the the numbers or well, the, the labels uh, 3a and 3b that's because it's picked those up through the context of the sentence as probably chemical words but it doesn't quite know what they are it sees them and, and thinks that they're labels just in the context of the sentence 
Now it can't know what they are yet, but let's let's move on to through the process for the time being. Having tokenized and uh, assigned a grammar to your sentence, it then turns all of that into a hierarchical tree, right? So it takes uh, the the figure, which is uh, the subject of the sentence, and it it then cat categorizes it. So it knows that it's figure two in the paper in question. It's a figure about a spectrum, and then what type of spectrum was it? Well, in this case, it's a UV absorption spectrum. So you know, in terms of type, then it's as opposed to a UV vis emission spectrum, for example, it has that hierarchy. And then it's a spectrum of something and it's a spectrum in something. So there's your context of the sentence coming into play. And it sees that it's a spectrum of two things, 3A, whatever that is, and 3B, whatever that is, and which are decoded by these different colors, red and blue. And then it sees that the spectrum uh, was uh, carried out uh, or measured, as it were, in acetonitrile. So, and it knows that's a chemical mention, so it will guess eventually that that's a solvent. Now, that would be the natural language pipeline up to that point in terms of generic text mining tools. And there are gen generic text mining tools, of course, out there. So why would, did we need chem data extractor? Well, the, the thing is that uh, it's, it's this chemistry aware aspect uh, of text mining that's so important. In fact, if you try and mine anything in the scientific domain uh, right across the physical sciences probably, but certainly in chemistry, you'll find that the generic natural language processing tools quite badly fail. And that's because there's so many specialist words in chemistry and physics and so on. And there's also uh, the just the way that people write. Even It's even different between chemistry and you know with inorganic and organic chemistry, for example. So what we really needed was then this way to um, resolve these labels, for example, that I'm about to come to and also deal with the chemistry specific words. So this is why chem data extractor as opposed to a generic natural language processing tool exists. So let's talk about then how we resolve these chemical labels, right? So the, the, the context of the sentence knew that 3A and 3B had something to do with the, the, these labels. And so what, it, what Chem Data Extractor does at this point is it, uh, it does what they call interdependency resolution. So it, it tracks back through the document to find usually at least the first instance of 3A and 3B. And it looks around that and usually right next to it, because this is the way that people write papers, it, uh, it will have some IUPAC name. So, you know, so you've got this long IUPAC name here and then it will say, bracket 3A bracket, right? And often it will be in brackets that the label or it will be in bold. So there are ways that you can then identify that that's the label and then match it with the either the formula or the IUPAC name and so on. And from that, you can then essentially make the label into resolve that into its actual chemical name. And in fact, actually, what we then do is turn it into a chemical character set that a computer can understand something called a smiles. So what goes then into the database is actually uh, all of that information, but with these chemical labels decoded into their chemical constructs uh, through these uh, chemical conductivity, for, um, uh, which is what we call SMILES. So then you have the chemical information, and in, if you like, in the traditional sense of a database, anyway, we don't really do it like this but anymore, but uh, you know, it would be like a, if you like a column of, of chemical uh, name, and then you know, another column would be its property, right? Now, we actually don't store it that way anymore, but just to give you the conceptual idea. So now you have a way to automatically make uh, these databases. Now, what I've shown you was the pipeline for text pros, uh, but actually we process tables slightly differently. So tables, of course, contain lots of information as well. And here, um, Tables uh, have an, uh, so, I mean, we use the advantage of the semi structured nature of tables, right? Because the person who wrote the table actually made these columns and rows and so on. So they're already p helping us by, by giving us some structure rather than it just being text prose. So we process these a slightly different way. And uh, here's, a, here's an example of what looks like a very innocent, you know, very simple looking table at the top here the die and its uh, lambda max, right? So the, the wavelength absorption maximum uh, for a given chemical. 3a in this case and um, the you as a human can probably read that uh, as you know some die with that's, that's labeled uh, 3a and then we know that it's uh, lambda absorption maximum is 448 nanometers and that its extinction coefficient epsilon is probably 29,000 per molar per centimeter 
right? Now that was very you know, straightforward for, for any chemist to read, but actually the computer's really gonna struggle with that. The reason is because particularly in that second column in the table header, you've actually got, uh, first of all, two properties in one cell, and you've got its, uh, its two constituent, uh, or rather cognate uh, units. So actually that's very hard to decode. And it, though, so when the computer looks at the value, if it doesn't know any better, it would probably read that as 448 somethings with an error of 29,000, which of course would be totally wrong, right? They're actually two different property values. So you often have to write uh, special rules um, uh, in code that then make sure that you can actually manipulate uh, uh, these these differences and and so on. So uh, this is the part where you know it's really important to understand that this is a tool and you're working with the tool, adding in your you know specific kind of rules, say, to uh, to enable your your specific properties of interest being mined. Anyway, so uh, so the key thing is then once you've you've um, put in your rules for your given property, then you can actually uh, pull out the chemical information and just you know resolve the chemical label in the way that we just talked about earlier for text. And uh, then we resolve the units and we work out what they are, and then we of course resolve the values and. The other thing to say is then we put the, the cell information all together with, say, the table caption information. And if there was a footnote, it can also pull out chemistry relevant information there, too. So in the, the example, you've got ca the caption contained the word temperature, and that would be, say, the temperature of the experiment, right, at room temperature. So that might be helpful as met extra metadata and uh, the footnote, you know, it looks like the solvent uh, for the experiment was acetonitrile. So those sorts of things are kind of enriching information that may be helpful to you. So combining all of the table and the text prose information, uh, we then put all of that data together in, in uh, uh, this construct here. All right, so it's, uh, and something to, I guess extra to say is it's, uh, you can also mine um, particular parts of the text if you wanted to know, say, what the instrument that was used to uh, measure uh, the data that, that, that which, you're, which you're investigating, then uh, that can be, that can also be extracted too. So the second, the second um, sort of extract down here would, you know, tell you what type of spectrophotometer was used in this experiment. That could be useful because if there is a particular commercial instrument that has a prescribed resolution, say, of the data, right? So, you know, you may that may be important for your needs. So anyway, so we put it all together and then that outputs into a custom materials database for you using the example that would be some UV vis absorption spectra database. If you're wondering how well ChemData Extractor works, well, um, the standard metrics uh, for this type of uh, sort of uh, natural language processing uh, are what they call precision and recall. So in, in sort of layman's terms, precision is, is uh, a measure of uh, what goes into the database is right. Uh, so obviously you want that to be 100% ideally. And recall is about what information that you could have obtained because it was in the literature did you manage to pick out so ideally you'd want to pick out all of the relevant information uh, so again you'd want that to be a hundred percent precision and recall can often compete against each other just to warn you so to get them both high is actually quite hard uh, we actually did uh, I guess pretty well. Uh, eventually, uh, we took some work, uh, but uh, this is then the the how well we do with uh, naming chemicals and uh, the spectral uh, type of information and properties that, that we pull out. Anyway, uh, just say that that was those uh, precision and recall metrics uh, were made. Uh, based on an evaluation set from organic chemistry. And that's because just by chance, the first uh, applications of chem data extractor were on organic materials. Uh, when we actually started to work on inorganic materials, uh, those precision and recalls initially at least fell <laughs> flew the floor. And that's an example of me saying that, you know, your chemistry domain uh, is very different in just the language. Uh, so we actually had to um, work on uh, uh, improving uh, chem data extractor for inorganic materials because the way people write about chemistry is different. Uh, so we had to factor in that. And if you're if you're working on inorganic uh, chemistry and you want to have a look at uh, uh, how we've improved that, for example, there's some some work in a later paper um, that I've just highlighted at the bottom left here. So anyway, so that's um, that's uh, what's going on under the hood. That's how you text mine chemical information to make your custom materials database information. 
So how having uh, now established a way to actually have the scientific literature as your data source rather than, you know, as it were, a, a sort of your input is a specific database uh, from made or available to, to you by some other means. Um, let's see how we would then put our, our as it were, scientific literature and chem data extractor into a pipeline for data driven materials discovery. So here's our four step uh, wonder to get us to materials discovery. Uh, on the, the top left, you, there's your academic literature, and we're going to you know, mine it through stage one, that they, let's call that data extraction, right, with Chem Data Extractor. And we're going to pull out you know, some type of uh, chemical uh, structure information and some physical property information. At that point, you already have a database, but uh, for certain for certain types of work, you might want to enrich that database. I essentially grab more data, the sort of greedy approach, I suppose, um, because you can enrich your your uh, experimental data that come from the literature with, say, quantum chemical calculations. Right? You could compute a whole load of uh, chemical data and add that to 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 your experimental data. Um, you could use machine learning to actually find uh, or populate uh, gaps in data. Data. Remember that what's coming from the academic literature uh, doesn't necessarily give you, you know, perfectly populated cells, right, for all the chemicals and properties, right, particularly if you've got several properties that you're mining, you may get uh, the chemical and uh, the property one, but you may not get chemical and property one and property two, right, so, but property two may be, say, the extinction coefficient in the example I gave you, and let's say property one was the lambda max, now lambda max you'd always get because that's the primary property that you're seeking, but, you know, if you're lucky you'll get the, the, the extinction cap value as well but so if that if that record is missing well if you've got enough data that you do know with uh, lambda max and extinction right and uh, uh, and then you know it's chemicals and then you'll know that say you've got a you've got a missing uh, 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 extinction coefficient so it's an empty field then if your chem if that for that chemical where there's a missing field you you have similar chemicals where you do have the extinction right and you've got enough of those examples you can actually start to guess what that value might be and that, that's where the, your machine learning can essentially um, you know fill in the gaps for you so that's another way of data enrichment anyway so that's uh you know at that point stage two you know you've really now got as much as many data as you can possibly hope to have right at that point, you then can say, OK, so now I'll, I'll mine the data and I'll either with, you know, either machine learning and in a different way since in classification and, and optimization, as it were, or you can uh, and or you can uh, apply and, and write or algorithms that define structure property relationships in certain ways. And then you can uh, uh, find these patterns in the data to make materials predictions. Once you've got materials predictions, you can then, of course, experimentally validate your data. And, you know, there's uh, just a few examples of how you might do that. Um, and if you'd like to see a sort of generic kind of tutorial level review, there's uh, there's an example at the bottom of the page here for you. So that's the pipeline. And uh, let's now look at a, a case study of uh, that in action. I'm just going to choose uh, an example of uh, light harvesting dyes for photovoltaics. And, you know, really, it doesn't really matter what I choose. I mean, it just happens to be, a, you know, one we've done. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the point is it could be generic, but it, just to try and give you some example of, of how this works. And I'm going to try and simplify this to uh, the, you know, really as just a, a problem um, of um, understanding, you know, how to get the maximum light from the sun, right? So simplifying even more than the, the, the sort of ins and outs of photovoltaics, for example. Um, so the black sort of squiggly line here is the solar emission spectrum, right? So that's, uh, that's, that's uh, the amount of light that's coming from the sun. And then if you want to have light harvesters, of course, they're absorbing that light from the sun, then of course, ideally, you would want, you know, uh, some some light harvesting material that would actually absorb uh, all of that profile, right, of the, the solar emission. Uh, so, you know, the sort of green there would be a sort of not quite, you know, entirely panchromatic, but that would do, be a very good dye, for example. But that green one doesn't exist, right, actually. Uh, so um, you would really want uh, uh, to maybe put several different light harvesting dyes together that would then together as a complement uh, actually um, uh, manage to have that panchromatic absorption of light, right. So the red and the blue chemicals there and their uh, corresponding uh, optical absorption spectra once uh, once if you like convoluted together would give you that green 
uh, panchromatic absorption. All right. So now, you know, if you imagine just, you know, you're just integrating under the under the, the, the area of under the curve, right? I mean, that would basically give you as many photons, right? So that's that's really the essence of the problem here, right? Trying to grab as many photons. But this is a trick that people really do play in, in photovoltaics, you know, putting two different dyes of complementary wavelengths and absorptions together. So we set out to say, uh, that people are doing this in the photovoltaics world, so what, what would be, you know, from a data mining perspective, the ultimate, you know, optimized combination of, say, two different dyes that would give you this panchromatic range, right, because people are otherwise just doing this empirically from the experimental perspective. We then built a, a pipeline. So right at the top, you've got you know extract data. So we extracted data using ChemData Extractor of UV vis absorption spectra. So that's your lambda max and your extinction coefficient and obviously the chemical. And that's at least at the time of, of, of this study, uh, we had just shy of about 10,000 chemicals in that in that database coming from ChemData Extractor. And the first thing we did actually was um, uh, we removed, uh, you know, sort of very rough filter. Um, and this sort of inverse pyramid, by the way, is, is deliberately a sort of filtering process. You're asking questions uh, from the data in the, that you've made with ChemData Extractor. Uh, uh, to say, you know, do, does does the chemical in, in this database obey this structure property relationship or does it obey this this condition, for example? And you go through a series of questions uh, where where the, the number of, you know, shortlist is of shortlist of the original database uh, gets smaller and smaller. And, you know, eventually only a few molecules will obey every single question and condition that you asked of it. Right. So um, so then you can hopefully get to a lead candidates. So, so let's let's look at the top. So you had then ten thousand uh, materials, and uh, we then said let's remove anything that doesn't actually absorb in the visible light. Uh, right, that's because partly we were we were sort of focusing on that bandwidth, um, and we also wanted uh, for practical environmental reasons to actually only find organic dyes. So we actually sort of obliterated all possibilities of organometallic dyes, which, by the way, made our life practically a lot harder, because if you know the field, you'll know that organometallic dyes dominate it. Um, but nonetheless, we wanted environmental regulation. So we said, OK, so let's 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 cut out everything there. So from, you know, sort of 9,431 in the original database, we instantly shot down to just over 3,000, right? So a factor of three reduction. And it's quite important to have these rough filters at the front end, right? Because otherwise, you'd, you've got a lot of questions to ask before you get to a few lead candidates at the end, right? So uh, that's one filter. And then we asked a second question, and this was a practical question really about, which comes to the uh, technology of the photovoltaic um, um, uh, 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 technology in question. And uh, th for that, uh, for certain dyes, for dye sensitized solar cells, which was the application area in question, uh, we knew that uh, chemicals that have carboxylic acid groups were particularly good at anchoring onto the titania, which makes the semiconductor surface, right? So, I mean, the details are not, not relevant here so much, but the key thing is you've got a practical constraint there that you wish to add and say, you know, out of the short list of your 3000, now you have, you know, how many of those chemicals also have a carboxylic acid group? Um, and we also asked that uh, how many also have a molecular glide mo moment of five Dubai or more. And that's because, um, uh, uh, for practical reasons in terms of you want your electron hole separation uh, to be such that you don't get electron recombination. Now, where do we get the dipole moments from, by the way? Uh, you'll see on the right it says enriching data, and that's because uh, we have these, uh, these the original experimental values from ChemData of Extractor, but we also, uh, for all of them, calculated them molecular dipole moments. So that's an example of enriching data to get a few more kind of properties uh, just with calculations. So that's a nice synergy to think about. So that, uh, that, that condition then, when you ask that of the data, then it goes from 3,000 right an order of magnitude down to 300 dyes, right? And uh, we then went in and wrote, we, we wrote a, uh, our own bespoke algorithm that then said, of those 309 possible uh, molecules, uh, what would be, which ones would have the optimum combination of uh, lam, la, the absorption max, uh, the, the, the lambda absorption max, right? So this is this idea that you saw in the previous uh, page where you had uh, these, these red and blue curves that, you know, you're trying to get the, the optimum ob absorption combination. So this was then a, an algorithm that literally was, uh, you know, uh, for, for optimizing these lambda max values for the, all sorts of, all the various pairs of these 300 uh, candidates. So then that dropped again an order of magnitude. So we found 30, 33 possible cases which would uh, which would uh, pass through that filter. 
And at that point, you know, we could pretty much go in manually and look at, you know, the, the original papers from where these uh, chemicals were, were born uh, for all manner of reasons, of course, they were made. And uh, we then said, uh, we actually then, well, we then we did actually, because there's only three, 33 of them, we actually did density functional theory calculations on them at that point, because that was quite easily manageable in 33 compounds. And we... Uh, we, we then calculated the, the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals and uh, various other energy levels. And that's because uh, while we've, you know, so far we've been considering these molecules in isolation, right? Um, but you've got to think about, you know, how those molecules would fit energetically uh, in terms of their energy alignment with other device components of your solar cell, right? So you've, you know, you've got a semiconductor and you've got a, an electrolyte and and so on. So you've got to you've got to think, well, you know, how much, you know, does my light go uh, is absorb light and then it it uh, can be channeled into with the right driving forces into the semiconductor and then, you know, how do you then get the recombination of electrons and so on? Anyway, the, the details are not relevant here, but the point is you've got to check that your molecule isn't just studied in isolation but really does consider the device but certainly from the energy perspective so that led us uh, that dropped another few and then um uh, we looked again also practically and said, uh, you know, how come, you know, how easy are these things to make, right? So that's uh, so a very practical question. Uh, it's not us just being a sort of cop out. Uh, I mean, you know, in the sense that, you know, if it's a 20 step reaction, that's going to be less viable commercially, particularly if the yield is about 0.1% uh, compared to something that's a one pot reaction that's, you know, giving 98% yield, right? So that's, that's quite an attractive thing you know, for commercial prospects, for example. So, so we did look at that practicality and that led us really just to five dyes uh, as our, our prediction of our lead candidates for uh, light harvesters for photovoltaic applications. So let's see then how we got on. So that's our prediction and we'll now look at the validation. So here are the five dyes in questions. And remember they came from the literature ultimately. So really what we're doing is re repurposing them in fact, right? So, but they were made for all manner of reasons. If you look at the original application, uh, the original papers, you know, they were sort of typically a sort of a synthetic chemist wanting to just make this because you can, right? And uh, that was kind of cool. Um, but uh, anyway, so so what happened is uh, I actually wrote to the uh, people who are the corresponding authors of those papers and said, hey, uh, we think your molecule, your compounds from that paper that you, met, you wrote might be useful for, for photovoltaic applications. Do you still have any of the sample? And uh, well, can you remake it? And, and would you mind if you're sending it? And if so, we can collaborate with you on this and uh, on the experimental validation. And they all replied, they were all very enthusiastic actually and uh, so we were very excited by that and uh, they all applied and sent sample um, and we put them into devices and uh, this is how we got on. Uh, the graph on the right uh, is in black is um, the what they call the uh, is effectively the industrial standard right N719 it's an organometallic dye remember we're looking for organic ones uh, but that's one of the best performing uh, dyes for dye sensitized solar cells right and uh, so if, if you can get your current density and your, versus your voltage to match that sort of black profile there um, for your your given uh, internal um, uh, uh, measurements, then, uh, you, you know, you're doing pretty well, right? So uh, the compounds to look at are XS6, given their original label from their original papers, and 15, right, the two in the middle. And we put uh, them first individually in the cells, right, in, in photovoltaic cells. So that means they shouldn't work so well, because remember, we were trying for the combination. And uh, in fact, you see then those uh, individually, uh, just just with one of those chemicals in the cell, uh, give you the red and the blue, right? So not, not, not so uh, good relative to the black profile, right, the industrial standard. But now look at the mauve color, right? That is when we put X, XS6 and 15 together, which was, of course, our design strategy to have these complementary optical absorptions of two dyes that together should make panchromatic optical absorption. And now you see actually that uh, that profile, um, at least um, this power conversion efficiency, which is basically the combination of the voltage and current density subject to power in and uh, something called the fill factor, but that, that gives you a power conversion efficiency of 92% that of the industrial standard. So we were you know, pretty happy about that because of course, we don't forget we're looking for organic dyes um, relative to the inorganics is the industrial standard, which is organometallic. 
So that um, people uh, got onto the front cover of uh, the uh, advanced energy materials, and uh, I draw out specifically these, you know, the fact that there are 18 authors, um, and uh, one of the reasons that there are 18 authors is that most of those authors are the synthetic chemists. And it's quite, I think, helpful to say because you know we're, we're doing all this design to device type uh, data driven materials discovery, um, but it then presents a very different way of working with synthetic chemists, right? So the old days you would typically say, oh, you know, to a synthetic chemist, I need this for some device have you any idea what you could make now we you know we're saying actually uh you've already made this for some totally different reason can you actually send us some stuff and we'll try and put it in a device for you so it's kind of you know sort of a very different way of talking to uh synthetic chemists and collaborating them but it's it's a really nice i think way of doing that actually because it's very directed for everybody concerned so there's a real example of successful uh design to device uh, for data-driven materials discovery. So I've used the example of UV-vis absorption spectra, and um, that's uh, then a database also in its own right. We've also been making other databases um, for other materials prediction, and uh, we've made a magnetic materials database, for example. Um, and uh, that also uh, uh, has superconducting materials in it because the two are of course linked. And we've made a battery materials database recently and that contains well the chemicals and five of its most popular properties, the capacity, voltage, conductivity, coulomb, efficiency and energy. Um, and they're all open source databases. They're published in a journal called Scientific Data. So uh, you can actually take the database and do your own uh, calculations and so on with them. I just wanted to mention a little bit about the uh, magnetic materials database uh, so that we've found and how we are using that data to mine for materials discovery, partly because uh, the, this example is quite nice, I think, to show a different aspect of putting all the data together. Um, and not only can we actually uh, predict materials in this kind of sort of pipe uh, inverse pyramid pipeline way that I just showed you, but we can actually use them to map phase space, right? So, so here's an example of a magnetic material, the, this lanthanum str strontium mag uh, mangalite. And uh, on the left is a holistic kind of cartoon that comes from a review article, you know, from somebody who was expert in the field about these materials. And, you know, they've mapped out the, the phase space um, for, you know, uh, where, they, where these materials are ferromagnetic or anti-ferromagnetic, paramagnetic, uh, for a given you know, strontium composition, X versus temperature, right? So that's your standard sort of phase map, uh, map uh, phase transition map for, for, for magnetism. Um, on the right, actually, you see a, a sort of dot-to-dot -dot map uh, of data that we've extracted of this series of compounds, uh, but we've extracted those, those data points purely via chem data extractor, right? So um, uh, we've we found uh, for the, the Curie and nail temperatures for, for the, from the literature uh, for uh, anything with the lanthanum chromite, uh, sorry, lanthanum str strontium manganite. And we've then literally just kind of plotted them, you know, literally it's dot to dot. It's nothing, we're not analyzing anything. We literally just, it really is just mapping it out uh, onto a page. And what's nice about that is you can see instantly, you know, we don't have, you know, 30 years of experience for the person on the left who wrote that review, right? We literally just kind of went, oh, well, all these are ferromagnetic in the red and the ones uh, in blue are anti-ferromagnetic. And we don't, of course, see all the possible phases, but you can even see with the anti-ferromagnetic kind of uh, uh, profile where we, uh, on the right, where, you, you know, we sort of dips down in the middle. And that's obviously it's going into the, you know, like the looks of the AF, the anti ferromagnetic phase A that the reviewers kind of uh, knows about, right? But this is us, you know, being ignorant about all of that. And we're just literally, you know, seeing things uh, as we map them. And so it's a nice example, I think, of us putting all the data together um, and actually then giving a different predictive sense just by mapping. And people could then say, oh, well, if you see a dip, then maybe there's a new phase for, you know, for some other. Uh, set of uh, compounds. Um, so that, that might be useful for people. And you can do the same with superconductivity. This is the um, some iron arsenides, uh, which are very popular superconductors these days. Um, and you can actually, uh, again, the cartoon on the right, you've got the superconducting uh, zone, zo uh, dome and so on. Um, and from, you don't have so many data, of course, here, but you know, you can predict the antiferromagnetic zone and this, where the superconducting critical temperature is there, because you can, we have, we've also extracted uh, critical temperatures of superconductivity for, for these materials as well. Anyway, so that's that. And um, we uh, have uh, 
a an application now so if you go to magneticmaterials.org you can even go in yourself and uh, uh, do these kind of uh, predictions yourself um, and uh, it's, it's again it's open source and I'll just give you a quick example of that uh, this is I mean you can do this dynamically I'm just showing you the screenshots of of the application but if you if you go into this uh, this application and you uh, click on uh, the the top it says uh, data analysis and uh, then you can choose from a periodic table you know let's say you wanted the you know the lanthanide chromites right so I've got all the lanthanides clicked to the chromium and the oxygen uh, then what it would first do is tell you uh, all of the uh, available sources of uh, that and what the pattern, uh, the relationship might look like. So here are all the lanthanum and chromites plotted against electronegativity against its nail temperature. All right. So uh, and I've just hovered over this, uh, the samarium, and then it looks like there were four instances actually of samarium happening. And it actually gives you the DOI for the original papers. So you can actually go back to the original papers to find the data from which it came. Right. And uh, now let's say in this particular case, I've deliberately shown it as electronegative because it conveniently shows the lanthanide contraction. But and it doesn't, of course, there's uh, there's nothing that ChemData's extractor has picked up in terms of the scientific literature with, let's say, cerium chromite. Right. So could we predict what the cerium chromite would be? Right. Of course, it's quite a straight line, so it's probably going to be fairly obvious what you might do. But just to give you the trivial example. Um, we would then write the formula, the Hill formula into uh, the box in the property prediction tab in the middle here. And we would then, uh, you've essentially got prescribed uh, machine learning uh, and feature selection uh, options. So you could you could choose various ones, but these are the ones I'm gonna go with. And then if you, if you click it, it does it automatically for you. And then it predicts, as you can see in the graph at the top now, it says CE predicted. That's, your, that's where it would predict the serum. Um, and if you click on it, it would actually tell you what feature vectors it used. So what was important to, to make that correlation and the predicted value exactly in terms of the nail temperature. Right. So anyway, I mean, you can go in and play with it and see how it works. And here's just one example of it used as well for superconductivity. So that's uh, that's uh, what we've been doing in terms of materials predictions there. And um, then, um, as I say, finally, we've most recently uh, uh, produced a battery materials database. And uh, that's actually got a quarter of a million data in. Uh, it's our biggest database by far, so far generated by ChemData Extractor. And uh, that's quite a nice number, not just psychologically, we're over the quarter of a million mark, but also because if you think about machine learning methods, you know, the, the, the most sophisticated people say that if, you know, sort of the deep, deep learning options, you need sort of a million data. Well, we haven't got a million, but, you know, a quarter of a million is actually a decent step in the right direction for that. So I just wanted then to close with uh, just to mention that I've mentioned I've gone through all about text mining today um, and how we're using that for data driven materials discovery. But I just want to show you one last thing, which is on image uh, data. Um, so uh, Chem Data Strategy is purely about text and tables, which of course is part of text. But we've also uh, made an application called Image Data Extractor, which actually grabs the figure information from the literature, specifically actually uh, figure information that uh, belongs to electron microscopy data. And that's because uh, what we're doing here is uh, we are pulling out uh, these electron microscopy data to, uh, and once, and you know, we use chem data extractor to do that as well, by the way, because the chem data extractor goes in and looks at the figure caption information and, you know, searches for keywords like SEM, TEM, and, and so on. And then if it finds those words, it then goes in, you know, it calls up image data extractor, and so it go, which goes in and then looks to see if it's got a uh, an, uh, uh, an image, so which could be in a panel, for example, uh, that looks like an electron microscopy image. And if it is, then it pulls it out and then it actually analyzes it. So uh, because just grabbing the figure information is no use if you can't actually interpret it, right? So, so uh, we then have image recognition tool, uh, which then analyze the image from electron microscopy, which you pulled out of the paper. Uh, let's say it's, you know, these particles like in the middle here, and it would then actually uh, work out the size and shape of the particles. And then if you've got enough particles that it detects, which I believe is more than 20, it's our default threshold, then it would actually plot essentially a radial distribution function of those particles. So that could be useful, say, for sort of nanotech type, um, type things. And uh, we're already working very close, uh, you know, closing in on a, a version two now uh, for that um, uh, software. So hopefully that one will be more, even more robust and, uh, and friendly for you. Anyway, but again, you can go to the, uh, uh, the, the website and have a look for yourself. So that's uh, that's all I've got. I, hopefully that's helpful. Um, and uh, really, just to uh, close, um, you know, I've shown you about text mining tools, and a bit of a hint about image mining as well. Um, I've um, uh, 
I've given you various references along the way, but uh, here's a sort of summary of most of them. Some websites for you to look at. Um, also, don't forget, uh, I didn't put it there, but magneticmaterials.org is as well for the if you are interested in that application uh, funding, of course. And, and thank you to uh, everybody. I've mentioned people on the way, but thank you to the, the synthetic uh, materials characterization chemists on the, the, the big paper of 18 authors. Um, and thank you, of course, to my group, uh, particularly those uh, who have been involved in the work I've mentioned today. And I've, I've named members across there and obviously the rest of my group at large for funding and thank you.